good morning to each and every one of you that's listening on live stream right now. Uh, you're probably seeing the service late, listening or seeing it, but we want to thank you for taking the time to join us. And for you folks that are here today, you know, welcome to God's house. Look, ain't it good to go somewhere and feel welcome? Have you ever gone someplace and you're not welcome? You know, like when you get at a restaurant five minutes before closing time and they give you a look like, oh, man, and she's got five kids, and, you know, and, and you say, uh-oh. Well, you're welcome in God's house today, not just by your pastor, but by God. This is his house, not my house. I'm just kind of like the custodian, head custodian. I'm taking care of it, but you are welcome in God's house. So that, that to God be the glory. Now, before we um, get into our service, I, I'm super excited because Craig is gonna uh, is going to bring the message today. And he, you know, I've known him for him and his wife and his family for many, many years. And I'm so excited that we're sharing the pulpit today. And I know I know you will be blessed. But I, I, I'm also excited kind of because you're here. And the Holy Spirit is always here, and he's not going to let us down. I'm going to invite you to stand with me. Excited about Wednesday night. Do not forget, Wednesday night we have our classes begin. James, uh, you're excited about something. What, what are you excited about, son? Oh, Wednesday night, yes. Wednesday night at 7 o'clock, uh, we, we have our, our classes begin. Bible study at 7 o'clock. At 7.45, we have a, a Cinco de Mayo hot cheese with no, no, not hot cheese. Hot Cheetos with cheese. The cheese is hot, though, in my defense. Hot Cheetos, hot cheese, fellowship at 7.45. And I heard that there's a piñata out there and a, a, a paintball with, I think, a Colleen's a target. We're going to have some fun stuff out here, okay? Some surprises, okay? Some surprises. She's a red target, the poor Colleen. Surprise. Uh, but anyway, folks, uh, before we start off, um, I want, I want, I like to pray for Darlene. Our Darlene's going to be going to, to the hospital tomorrow. And, and. Darlene, if, you, if you'd like to come up, I'd like to pray with you. Pray for you. Uh, if her family's here, you, you feel free to come up. I just want to pray with you. I know you already know, Darlene, but maybe you're at home and you cannot be here today. And I want you to know that we still believe in prayer. And, and even when you can't come to church, God goes to you. So we're still ahead. Would you like to turn around, guys? That way we can, we can face the camera. And now, I'll, we're going to pray for Darlene. You're going to the hospital tomorrow, right? Is this uh, a three-month post-op MRI? Okay. A three-month post-op MRI. Uh, I'd also like to, in testimony, Hermana Castro was in the hospital, had surgery, you know, and she's doing well right now, right, Letty? So the Bible says, with thanksgiving, make your request known unto God. So as we pray for Darlene's healing, let's remember that God took care of Mrs. Castro. You know, uh, let's remember that Hermana Escobedo from our Spanish service, she's in the hospital right now as well. Okay, keep them in your prayers. There's other needs. Some people are, it's not a, a, a physical health, it's a financial or it's emotional. Uh, keep in prayer, Beth. Beth is moving to San Antonio. You know, she's still part of our family, Beth. No matter where you're at, you're part of our family. But God can help you with all those things. Okay, I'm so grateful, Craig, that the God that we serve is not just the God that wants to save your soul and forget about everything else. You know, the God that we serve, Jerry, is concerned when your car doesn't work and you don't know how you're going to get to work that day. You know, when you need to pass that course, kids. And uh, if you don't pass, you're going to have to be retained. We have a God that cares about those things, okay? When you're going through pressure at work, your family, your roof is leaking, you need to catch up on your finances. We have a God that cares about every aspect of your life. So don't ever tell someone, no, I don't want you to pray. It's nothing major. You're major to God, so everything that concerns you is major to him. Amen? Everything. So, darling, we're going to pray to the Lord. Let's pray together, folks, okay? Father, in the name of your son, Jesus Christ. Now, I've known Darlene all of her life, dear God. And I know that she loves you. And I know she serves you, Lord. And I not, now I'm seeing her child serve you as well. I pray that your hand be upon Darlene in a mighty and special way. I pray for your favor and grace. And Lord, the way I saw you heal at Manacastro in this difficult surgery this week. And the one I'm trusting that you're going to watch over at Manacastro in the hospital right now. And the way I know that you're going to be with Beth as she moves to San Antonio. I can trust that you're going to be with Darlene there at the hospital. Thank you for being the God. There's some needs that are private this morning in our church. There's some needs that are never put into words because we just can't. We don't know what to pray for. But the epistle of Romans tells us that even through our groans and our utterings, Lord, the Holy Spirit makes intercession for us that we pray as we ought to pray. So Father, for all those petitions in our hearts that never become verbalized, for every need, Lord, that we've shared this morning, we're going to trust you. And we pray for healing over Darlene. 
We pray for health, for restoration, Lord, that she be made whole. Thank you for never changing. Churches might change, but you don't. That same Jesus in the Bible is, uh, is among us today, walking among us today. And we place Darlene in your care. It is in Jesus' name we pray. And the people of God said, amen, which means it is true, Darlene. Amen? In Jesus' name. Thank you, David Diana. Thank you, Amanda. Well, good morning, all those who are here as visitors. We want to say welcome to New Life at the Cross. We're here to worship God. I want to start with a scripture that um, defines this song. Uh, 1 Thessalonians 5, 16. Yes, 16. It says, uh, rejoice always. You know, it says, pray continuously and give thanks to God in all circumstances. Okay, I think this is something uh, the writer of Psalms, some of the chapters, he keeps acknowledging this truth that we serve a powerful God, that whether trials come, whether things get tough, blessed be his name. Amen. So that's what we're going to sing. We're going to sing songs that are beautiful sound to his ears, that are going to praise his holy name. So if you would join us with the song, blessed be your name. Blessed 
Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your name. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your glorious name. Thank you. you give and take away. You give and take away. My heart will choose to say Lord blessed be you your give name and take away. you give and take away you give and take away my heart will choose to say Lord blessed be your name blessed be the name of the Lord blessed be Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your glorious name.
pour out our praises, your breath in our lungs. So we pour out our praise to you only. Yes, Jesus. is our only desire this morning is to worship you. And that we may bless your name and that whatever is going on or our confusion and that in our hard times this week Father, because we can be really honest at this moment, sometimes we question a lot of things. But Father, just you to be evident in our lives right now that we can recognize that you are still in control over everything. So we worship you because you alone are God, our shield. This moment as we prepare our hearts and our minds to receive your word and continue in worship throughout the week. We pray, Father, that this word may penetrate to the deepest parts of our heart and that we may take this and share, but also answer, answer who you are. So all this in your name, in Jesus Christ, we ask. Amen. You may take a seat. This moment... Uh, 
Brother Craig and Sister Elizabeth are going to come forward. Oh, Brother Craig, actually, it was only Sister Elizabeth in Spanish. Yes. Uh, Pastor Craig is going to come up here, and he's going to share a word for us. And again, I, I ask this from you, that you may be ready to just receive word and also share word. And part of continuing worship through the word is that we may listen and may hear God's words, but also act upon what he's asking from us. So we pray that this morning you, you may come up here and you may receive what God has for you. Thank you, Brother Marco. Okay, uh, I would like to thank all of you for uh, being here today. Thank you, Brother Raul. It's a real honor to fill in for Brother Raul. I know I don't have to tell you guys what a blessing he is, and um, and uh, we just thank God that uh, that he is a pastor that cares about what the Lord says. Uh, believe it or not, there's some that don't. So, but uh, but that is the truth of our society today, and so uh, like I say, it is a real blessing uh, to be here today and uh and bring this message i want us to talk about the sovereignty of jesus this uh this morning because that's something i think that's uh kind of uh confusing in today's world so i thought we could uh, look at that what exactly does that mean when we talk about the sovereignty of jesus what exactly is that talking about turn if you would in your bibles to hebrews chapter one hebrews chapter one verses 1 through 4 in the book of Hebrews I will uh, go ahead and read that off and then we'll go into prayer and see what God has for us in this text long ago God spoke, spoke to the fathers by the prophets at different times and in different ways different ways excuse me in these last days he has spoken to us by his son whom he has anointed heir of all things and through whom he made the universe he is the radiance of his glory and the exact expression of his nature. He sustains all things by his powerful word. After making purification for sin, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high, so he became higher in rank than all the angels, just as the name he inherited is superior to theirs. May we pray. Father, help us to... Uh, know what it is lord jesus that you have for us in this message we thank you that you're sovereign because we see a lot of issues in our world lord and uh if if you weren't in control of them it'd be a very scary situation but we thank you every day that you're in control we thank you that you care about us uh, like brother raul just said father we thank you that you care about the small things in our lives and so we just lift this uh time up to you pray that it'll be one that'll glorify your name in jesus name amen if I told you the name of Manfred von Richthofen, who, who would know who that is? Anybody? No? Manfred von Richthofen? Kind of an unusual name, right? Well, you may not know who the, guy, the, the man's actual name, but you've probably heard of his nickname. His nickname was the Red Baron. So we have the Red Baron in the Peanuts cartoons. There's a Red Baron pizza. So there's the there's, there's Red Baron almost all of us has heard of. Well, he was actually a fighter pilot in World War I, and he was probably one of the most famous pilots uh, that ever lived. He was in the German Army, and he was credited with uh, shooting down a minimum of 80 planes. He even shot down the best guy that the British had uh, in their Air Force at that time as well. And this was in World War I. But on the morning of April 21st, 1918, he was flying behind enemy lines when an Australian machine gunner saw him at treetop level and so he fired off some rounds and von Rochthofen was hit he was hit in the chest he managed to land the plane but he died before he could get out of the plane so even though he had been an enemy the allies had such a respect for him and his his knowledge and his abilities and his accomplishments that the next day the allies the, the australian army stopped fighting in that area 
and they gave von Richthofen a funeral with full military honors. Allied squadrons stationed nearby even stationed nearby even presented memorials, and one of them made a flower wreath that said "To our gallant foe, to our gal, to our gallant and worthy foe." Excuse me. So now von Richthofen was a man that had an unusual a talent, to, unusual ability to be a fighter pilot. He was very good at it. And uh, that's one reason why we remember him today. He had an ability that most guys do not have. In our day, in, in our society today, though, there's, there's an issue because I think a lot of people will look at Jesus as if he is some kind of version of, 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 of Captain Manfred von Richthofen. That there's this cosmic battle going on and that Jesus is, is going up against the devil, and that Jesus is a guy with the skill, that he's a guy with the ability, and he's the one that has the ability to, to bring it all about and to win it all. But when you look at the Bible, that's wrong. Because the Bible tells us that Jesus is sovereign God. A friend of mine I used to work with told me that they spoke tongues in his church, and that the reason they did that was because that was a secret language and they could pray to God, and the devil wouldn't hear it. Now, there's a lot of issues with that, but I told him, first of all, that he was wrong on the issue of God's sovereignty, because what you're saying there is God's not sovereign. Because if Jesus says that the devil will not hear a prayer, then you can get on top of the roof, uh, on top of, the roof of a building with a megaphone, and you can scream at your loudest, and he's not going to hear it. And that's all because Jesus said so. That's because he is sovereign God. So, as I said before, the idea of meaning sovereign is, is confused in this world today. A lot of people get confused on what exactly that means. But I think by looking at Hebrews 1 here, we can get a grasp of it. So we will do that. We'll break this down verse by verse, and we'll, and we'll see what the, what the text has for us. Now, in verse 1, the, the passage opens up, uh, it's telling us that God spoke. As our transcendent creator, God is unknowable unless he makes himself known to us. And, and, and God has made himself known to mankind in two ways. Number one is what's called God's general revelation. God's general revelation, we see that being revealed to us in nature. When you go outside at night and you see the vastness of the universe, when you, when you look at your own body and you realize that uh, I think one scientist has said there's enough blood vessels in your body that if you connected them, it would make a line from here to the moon. When you look at that, when you look at life itself, and when you look at the other things in nature, that's enough knowledge that God has given us for us to know that somebody created it. When you look at the vastness of the universe and you, and you study it, it's just impossible to have come about on its own. As a matter of fact, uh, life cannot come out of two inert substances. I was telling my wife the other day, they, was a, uh, they, they had a big deal about finding ice on the moon. Okay, so they found some ice on the moon, so they were all excited about that. Well, that's not the issue. The issue is, can hydrogen and oxygen, two inert chemicals or gases or, or compounds, whatever you want to call it in this case, produce something that's alive? And that's impossible. That's impossible. That cannot happen. Okay, so when we look at all of that, that is God's general revelation. And like I say, that's enough for us to know God, know that there is a God, know that all this was made by somebody, but it is not enough to save us from our sin. We have the, the way that which brings us to our second revelation of God, which is the Bible. Now in the Bible, we do find enough knowledge to be able to save us from our sin. And the Bible, and here in Hebrews, it tells us that in times past, God used different ways to communicate to people. We can see that in the Old Testament, right? You could see angels. You could see prophets. God even used a donkey one time to communicate to Balaam, right? But the key there is, is that God did reveal. God did put forth knowledge so that we can know about him. And God did so in the Bible through what is called his progressive revelation. And what that means is when you start out of Genesis chapter 1, you start getting information about God. Well, as you go through the Old Testament, you start to get more and more and more information about God. He does not reveal it all at once. You have to read through the Old Testament until you get to, and, and like I say, as you, as you progress, as you go further through it, you find out more information about God. And so by the time then that you get to the New Testament, you, you get to, the, to, to Jesus Christ actually coming down in the body of a man, 
to, to live on earth, by the time you get to Jesus, then you do have God fully revealed as a man. Jesus Christ is 100% man, and he's 100% God. And there's a lot of that that we can't understand. That's okay. He didn't tell us to understand it. He just tells us to believe it. Okay? All right, so when we do that, we can see as we go through Scripture, we learn more and more about God. Now, to understand this passage that we're talking about here in Hebrews, excuse me, and to get a good grasp of the book of Hebrews, we need to understand some Jewish history, uh, and this goes back to the covenant made with God. If you'll remember, after the flood of Noah, God called one guy, Abraham, and God made a covenant. A covenant's a deal, almost like a business deal. God made a covenant with Abraham and his children that they would, they would bless the world forever. And of course, he was talking about, and Abraham didn't know it at the time, but God was setting up his family for Jesus Christ to come through. And that was the covenant that he made with him. So Abraham told him, or God also told him, he said that your children will be slaves for 400 years and that God would bring them out after slavery to serve him. And that's exactly what he did. So if we go to Exodus chapter 19, let's take a look at that covenant real quick. Exodus chapter 19, verses 3 through 6. Back in the Old Testament. Uh, so Moses went up to the mountain to God, and the Lord called him from the mountain. This is what you must say to the house of Jacob and explain to the Israelites. You have seen what I did to the Egyptians, how I carried you on eagles' wings and brought you to me. Now if you listen to me and carefully keep my, com my covenant... You will be my own possession out of all of the prophets, although all the earth is mine. And you will be my kingdom of priests and my holy nation. These are the words that you are to say to the Israelites. So God wanted to make a covenant with the nation of Israel. And that's what he did. So I want you guys to be my kingdom of priests. So God said he was going to be their God. So he was going to be their government. He was going to protect them militarily. He was going to feed them. God was going to take care of every, every need that they had. And in return for that, they were to be a nation of priests. That's what God tells us there. So we see that. So God comes to them and tells them that. Excuse me. Now, the Old Testament law was the standards by which this nation of priests were, were to live. He gave them a way to set up their, because they had just come out. They weren't a country yet at that time. So that's why he gave them the Ten Commandments, right? Those, that's the basic laws for your country. And then they had the religious laws that would apply to them uh, living for God as on the religious side, uh, if you will. But we can see also in, in Exodus 19 that the people agreed to do that. They said, okay, God, we'll, we'll be your nation of priests. You take care of us, and, and we'll be your nation of priests. Sounds simple, right? Well, the reason God did that is because God's number one plan for the entire universe is for lost people to come to him. There's nothing more important than God than you because God died for you. And so if you haven't accepted Jesus Christ as your Savior by coming to him in repentance and asking him to forgive your sin and making him the Lord of your life, then you can do well, you can do that today. But that is God's top priority in the universe is for people to come to know him. God died so that people could come to know him. You, you can't do any more than that, right? That's the most you can ever do for somebody. Okay? So that's what happens with that. And so that was his redemptive plan. And, and we can see it. Uh, and so... So just as with this kingdom of priests then, they were sub just as we look back 2,000 years ago to the salvation that happened on the cross, they were to look forward to the Messiah coming. And as a nation of priests, they were supposed to be telling everybody else about that. Okay, But we can see that they did not do that. As a matter of fact, it got to the point in 1 Samuel chapter 8, verse 7. If you want to turn there, I can read it real quick. In 1 Samuel chapter 8, verse 7. It got to the point where they denied God. And in verse 7, But the Lord told him, he's talking about Samuel here, because they've come to Samuel, and they've said, Samuel, we want a king. We don't want any more judges. We, we want a king. Samuel was against it, but God tells Samuel this, But the Lord told him, Listen to the people and everything they say to you. They have not rejected you. They have rejected me as their king. So this covenant thing never even got off the ground because they didn't do what they were supposed to. And as we can see in the book of 1 Samuel, it got to the point to where they even didn't want God to be their king anymore. They wanted to have an earthly king. So God let them have what they, what they were asking for, even though he knew that was a, a worse situation for them. You know, with God as your government, it can't get any better. 
Uh, I don't care what your political affiliation is, right? I mean, if you've got God as your government, that's it, right? Well, they didn't want that. They wanted a king. That ended up leading to the nation being divided and the people being carried away, and the people were ruled by foreign powers. Now, remind, remember, when the time of Abraham was probably about 26, 2,700 years before Jesus, right? So this is about three to 4,000 years in our time now, right? And all that God had prophesied, okay? Well, they, 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 they did that. They got a king. They became a nation. As we know then, they split, and they were carried off into exile because, there again, their refusal to obey the covenant and not doing what the Old Testament law had told them to do. And they, they did not become a nation again, ruling themselves. There were people still in the area, okay? but they did not until 1948. Until after World War II in 1948, they became the nation of Israel that we have today. Okay? So... This is what their fathers uh, spoke about. That's why God was telling the prophets, he was telling the guys in the Old Testament, this redemptive plan, but they never did it. It got to the point to where they didn't even want to listen to God. Now, just because God was having the nation of Israel as his chosen people, that does not mean God was not working elsewhere in the world. Excuse me. We, continue, we can continually see God moving on other nations. For example, in Numbers 22, 9, we see that Balaam was a prophet. Okay, God came to him, but he was corrupt. He corrupted himself. So he became a false prophet by corrupting himself. But God originally had him there, uh, but he corrupted himself. And then there again in Jeremiah 40, we're told that the word of the Lord came to a Babylonian captain. And the Babylonian captain was, was Nebuzarzan, who stated that God had allowed, a, allowed Jerusalem to be captured because of the people's sin against God. The exact same message Jeremiah had preached to him for 40 years, and they didn't listen to him. As a matter of fact, the, the, the Babylonians treated Jeremiah far better than his own people did. They didn't know about God. They didn't want to know. Like I say, they didn't even want to hear what the prophet had to say. So God is still working to bring others through himself, but it was through the Jewish nation that salvation, that forgiveness of sin was to come. Now in verse 2, we see the term last days. When, we're, when, when we look at the Old Testament, scholars, in order to date it, one of the key things in history that happened, and Jesus predicted it would happen, was the Roman destruction of, of the city of Jerusalem in A.D. 70. Okay. So if we see an, an old writing or you see a biblical writing, it doesn't mention that. It's more than you know nine times out of ten. It was because it was written before that event actually happened. Okay. So Hebrews... Then we can we can, was was written before then it was written believed to be written by the apostle Paul around 65 A.D. the book we're looking at here. So just from verse two alone of the book of Hebrews, because it tells us in these last days, we can know that we are in the last days. And there's several scriptures in the Bible that show us that as well. Okay, and I didn't mean to get off track on that, but again, remember Jewish history. God's redemptive plan was to be advanced by the Jews, telling the Gentiles about Jesus who was to come. And uh, we, see that, uh, we see that again come up in uh, the book of Daniel, in Daniel chapter 9, right? Uh, Daniel chapter 9 talks about Jesus' life, how he's come and everything. And in 926, and, and that, that's all, believe me, that's a whole lesson in on, or a whole, whole series right there, Daniel chapter 9. But anyway, John, Daniel chapter 9, 26 tells us that Jesus was cut off. So Jesus... Was, was not accepted by the Jewish nation. And those are the ones that he, he came to save all of us, but he came to get that going through the Jewish nation. Well, the Jews rejected him, right? Because you remember Pilate stood in front of the Jews and, and asked them what did they want to do with their king, and they said what? They said crucify him. So they chose a murderer and an insurrectionist over Jesus. So the Jewish rejection of Jesus at that point caused, caused God to... Uh, it's called, called God to root his redemptive plan through history through another means. So when Jesus was rejected, God then began his redemptive plan of mankind through the church. And that's where we're at today. So that's why the day we live in today is called the church age. Okay, Because God's redemptive plan to bring human beings to him today flows through the church. And the church is uh, how God brings people to himself. Now, at the rapture, all that will change because God's going to take the church out. And he'll at that time pick back up again with the nation of Israel. 
and, and, and then continue on in history then. That's why when we see in the book of Revelation, you'll see a lot of people will come to know Jesus uh, during the Revelation. We're told of 144,000 of them are just, just, just alone are going to be Jewish. So there's going to be a lot of people during that time. But since the Jews rejected Jesus 2,000 years ago, they get the Great Tribulation. But their rejection of Jesus didn't show God's plan, didn't slow God's plan down one bit. All God did was just ship his redemptive plan through what, what became the church, which is us, and kept right on going. So that's why, and Jesus, of course, is sovereign over the church because we're talking about Jesus' sovereignty. Okay? The, the, the Bible says that the church is the bride of Christ. Okay? When we die as Christians, we're going to live with Jesus forever in heaven and uh, in, in the new heaven new earth. We won't get into that. That's a lot, of, a lot there. But it, it, just keeping still with his sovereignty. Okay? And... Uh, so there again. So when you reject Jesus, it, it doesn't it doesn't slow down God's plan one bit. God's plan keeps right on going. You know, you're the one that ends up getting hurt by that. So don't do that. So we can look at the Bible then and see, like I say, that Jesus is sovereign and that we are in the last days uh, at this time. Uh, and there's several scriptures that tell us that, but I think one of the really good ones I want us to look at for today is Second Peter chapter three, verses three through seven. Second. Peter chapter 3, verses 3 through 7. This, of course, Peter is writing about this, and I'm, I'm, I'm kind of I'm kind of bear with me. I'm tying it all into to Jesus' sovereignty. If you haven't got it yet, we'll, we'll get it. We're going to wrap it up. So, but uh, and, and Peter tells us in, uh, first, beware of this. Scoffers will come in the last days to scoff, following their own lust, saying, Where is the promise of his coming? For ever since the fathers fell asleep, all things continued as they, as they have been since the beginning of creation. They will fully ignore this. Long ago, the heavens and the earth existed out of water and through water by the word of God. There again, John chapter 1 calls Jesus the word of God. Okay, Jesus is the word. Through, the, through these, the world at that time perished when it was flooded by water. But by the same word, the present heavens and earth are held in store for fire, being kept until the day of judgment and the destruction of ungodly men. So Peter tells us then that in the last days, and, and Peter gives it, there again, he brings up the word he's talking about there, the word of creation. That's talking about Jesus uh, as well. But Peter is telling us then that in the last days, people are going to laugh at the idea of Noah's flood. Well, did you know that up until the Enlightenment period, which is about the mid-1700s, uh, and every scholar, both secular, Christians, Muslims, even Chinese, no scholar had any question or doubt about Noah's flood. There's just that much evidence out there for it in the archaeological record and that kind of stuff. But what happened during the 1700s and started in Europe, uh, kind of as a form of liberalism, it just kind of grew from there. And uh, what happened there, though, was, was people began to doubt the Bible. The Bible came under a lot of criticism. Uh, the, the people began to twist what the Bible was saying. Uh, they turned around what the Bible was saying. They lied about it. And all that began to have people to cause a lot of doubt about the Bible. And it was a satanic attack, okay? And it was fluenced uh, so that today. And, and it was such a successful satanic attack that there's not one secular organization today that believes in Noah's flood. The Smithsonian Institute doesn't believe in Noah's flood. Uh, the Woods Hole Institute, those are the guys that found the Titanic. They don't believe in Noah's flood. They also found a village at the bottom of the Black Sea, and they claim that that was actually Noah's flood, that Noah's flood was in the Black Sea area and that this village had got flooded. Uh, that they're, they're talking about that. that they, they claim that's where the biblical account of Noah's flood came from. Okay, And uh, clearly that's, that's incorrect. But in the National Geographic Society, right, they're another group of people that do not believe in Noah's flood. So we can see just from looking at that and, and what Second Peter tells us in chapter 3, we can see that the prophecy made by Peter has come true and it's just further evidence that we are living in end times. But not only are we living in these times, we're living in the times where that God has spoken to us through Jesus. Okay, folks, Jesus is God's full re revelation to the world. It was God's goal for Jesus to put on flesh in order for God to be known to mankind. He is the complete and full revelation of the Old Testament. Now, by Jesus being heir of all things, God has given all creation to him. So Jesus is the creative power in the creation account. We saw that there again in Peter, where Peter talked about the word. 
there again go back to John chapter 1 and you can read about the word there but that's clearly a uh, it's a name for the Lord Lord Jesus and so he's the heir of all things and God has put all things under his hand so when God said let there be light in Genesis 1 3 Jesus was the word that did the action so we'll look at real quickly uh, what's been called then the seven praises that start from the book of Hebrews and to show that Jesus uh, and everything connected to him are superior to all that was before him. I'm talking about the Bible, or the Old Testament, excuse me, because he fulfilled that. Uh, in verse 2, we see Jesus is the heir of creation, for all things, have been, 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 all things have been made. Now this means that Jesus is creator God. Colossians 1.15 puts it as Jesus is the firstborn. Now, that's not meaning that he was actually physically born. Uh, that is a rank. It's a title. But it's Jesus is God himself is what that's telling us. I know some cults say that means that he was actually born, which he was born as a person to Mary, don't get me wrong, but it wasn't. that's not the kind of birth it's talking about because Jesus always existed. Okay. Uh, number two, the universe was made through him. We see that in, in Hebrews here as well. He's a creator through which all things have come to exist. In John 8, 58, we see that Jesus makes the statement, I am. In Exodus 3, 14 and 15, the English translation of the first person singular Hebrew verb to be is describing himself. It, it, it means to be. It means the self-sufficient one. It means he doesn't rely on anybody else. It means he, he's it. There's none above him. Okay. Well, when Jesus said he was uh, I am in John 8, 58, that's what he was claiming. Uh, we also see then... Uh, that Jesus uh, also said in, in John 10, 30, that the Father and him are one. Now, I have a son, and me and him are a lot alike. Okay, we, we like to do the same things, and, and uh, you know, I can see a lot of myself in him um, and, and watching him grow and everything, but we're not the same person. But when you look at John 10, 30, that's not what Jesus said. Jesus said that him and God are the same. They're one. And they are. We know that because of the Trinity. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. So Jesus is claiming his divinity when he makes that statement. Uh, and then to, to continue on with our, our, our breakdown of Hebrews here real quick, uh, we see that Jesus is the Word of God. There again, we talked about John 1.1. 1, 1. That means that Jesus is the sustainer. Okay, And when it talks about a sustainer, that's actually, there's an area of science which kind of studies that, I guess you could say, area of science, but... Uh, uh, anyway, they, they've made a whole lot of, of discoveries uh, really within the last uh, few decades. You know, For example, they found out that if, if an atom's weight was off by less than 1%, when you look at the atoms in the universe, right, that that would cause the universe to collapse if the weight of an atom was just off by that much. Okay? Or the Earth's rotation is another example. If the, if the, if the Earth ro were to speed up, just a little bit in its rotation, everything would get thrown off into outer space. And yet if it slowed down just a little bit in its rotation, we would all get so seasick we'd die. So when it talks about Jesus being a creator and sustainer, he, main, he, sustainer, he maintains its perfect balance, very fine-tuned. We see that throughout our universe. It's a very fine-tuned uh, operation that we have going on there, which shows that it is being maintained and it's being sustained at the same time. Well, Jesus is the one then that, that said he did that. So it's the fine-tuning of the universe, which is actually a very strong proof for our creator. Okay. Now, Jesus is also the priest of God who provided the perfect sacrifice for all of humankind. Because of the fact that we're human beings, every one of us in here has sinned. Jesus died for that sin. So we don't have to go to hell. Nobody has to go to hell. They can accept Jesus and he'll forgive them, you know. And God wants everybody to do that. God wanted Adolf Hitler to come to him in repentance. God wanted Saddam Hussein to come to him in repentance, right? But those guys chose not to do that, so because God doesn't want anyone to go to hell. Jesus, Jesus willingly made himself a human being to be executed for human beings, and that's how he can relate to us. And that's how we, when we see in Mark verse four thirty eight. We're told that he was so tired that he slept on a cushion. Why? Because he's all man. But in Mark 4.39, he gets up and calms the sea. He's all God. And that's how we can see in Mark 11.12 11, that Jesus was hungry. He's all man. But in Matthew 14, he feeds 5,000 people. He's all God. 
Jesus was the baby in the manger, all man who made his mother, all God. Okay? So he is the king who sits at the right hand of the Father. Jesus is the king of the universe, but he's not limited by the universe. The universe does not have an effect on Jesus. He affects it. He can go into it, out of it. He can do whatever he wants to do with it, right? He's outside of it. It doesn't affect him. Why? Because he's sovereign God. That's why. He is the king of kings for all time. When the high priest would enter the tabernacle to offer sacrifices for the people, there was not a chair in there because their work was never done. The high priest would have to continually go back under the Jewish sacrificial system uh, of the temple. He would go in once a year to continually make sacrifices and, and offerings for the people. Jesus doesn't have to do that. That's why the Bible tells us that Jesus sat down at the right, right hand of God. When Jesus made his sacrifice, that did it. That covered it. Okay. His sacrifice was for once and for all. And that's why he was able to sit down, because he accomplished it. Jesus paid the bill. By the power of God, as Jesus finished giving him the same, the, the name above all names. And we see that because of what Jesus did and because of the power in his name. He is who, he, who the Bible claims he is. He backs that up. Now in verse 4, like I say, just to kind of kind of finish up here, I'll, I'll go into that. It's Jesus' name here that means much more than the title or address. When you see it, talking about the, the name right here, think of power, think of authority, right? Because if you remember, the Pharisees came to Jesus, said, in whose name do you cast out demons? They tried to say he cast them out in the name of Beelzebub, which is just another name for the devil, okay? But that's not the case at all. And that's when Jesus said, what? Well, the, yeah, why would you, the devil's not going to cast out demons. That's, that's working against his own house, right? That's not going to be annulled. So when you think of name here, think of final authority. Think of, uh, think of the power that goes with it, what it represents. Uh, when it comes to name, I, was, uh, I, I, I saw a story about that that kind of, uh, kind of reminded me something of that. And the story was told of a wealthy Englishman who decided he wanted to take a driving tour of the continent of Europe. So he went to Rolls Royce and he purchased a new car, which he then shipped to continental Europe. After traveling some time, the car broke down. So he called back to Rolls Royce and explained what had happened. Within 30 minutes, the head of the mechanic was on the, the company's executive jet and he was flown to where the man was. The mechanic found the man, he opened the hood, he worked for about 15 minutes, then he closed the hood, the car cranked up fine, and the Englishman went on his way. The Englishman gave the mechanic his, uh, his mailing address and told him to have the bill mailed to him, and he would pay it when he got back. Well, when the man returned home, he began searching through his mail, and he couldn't find his bill from Rolls-Royce for his repair. And so he didn't know what to do. So being the type of guy who always pays his bills, and he didn't want to be accused of not paying his bills, he called the company billing department. Well, to his surprise, he was told that there was no record of any work being done on a breakdown. Well, he knew that couldn't be right, so he called the company receptionist, and he kept getting bounced from desk to desk and, and going around from department to department. Well, he was getting me very agitated with this when they directed his call to the company secretary. And it was the company uh, secretary that explained to him there were some things that he did not understand. You see, she informed him that when a person purchases a Rolls Royce, uh, excuse me, a person purchases a Rolls Royce automobile, they need to understand that they're purchasing the most luxurious car ever made. She explained how the parts were handmade, how the stitching was all done by hand in all the seats. She explained to him not only was the car the most luxurious, but the car represented the, uh, the height of quality in automobile production. But that's not all she said. It's the most expensive car in the world because it's backed up by the name Rolls-Royce. And the Rolls-Royce name means the highest in all categories of automobile production. And since it, was, it, is, a, it is backed up by the name of Rolls-Royce, the man needed to understand that when a Rolls-Royce is purchased, it doesn't break down. So, sir, she told him, so there is no record and she hung up the phone. Ladies and gentlemen, we need to understand something, right? When Jesus claimed to be sovereign God, he, he, he paid the sin debt that, that, that we can't pay. 
And he came down here and he did that for us. And he did that because of his name, because of the power he has, because of the authority, right? So if you're a Christian, and that means you've come to Jesus Christ in repentance and believe in your heart and confess with your mouth that God raised him from the dead, when you stand before God on Judgment Day, the enemy is going to be there. And he's going to tell God about all the times you lied, how you cheated, how you stole, how you lusted. And he's going to throw everything he can at you. And he'll even have proof to back it up that it's true. Yet because of the name of Jesus, and because of the sovereignty of Jesus, and because of the blood he spilled for us by being tortured on Calvary, when God the Father looks down, Jesus, who is sovereign God himself, will answer, but there's no record. Amen. There's no record. May we pray. Thank you. Father, thank you for Jesus, and thank you for what he did for us, and thank you that he is sovereign God, because only he could do what God can do. And he, he paid that price for us. And Father, help us to all realize that and live in that in everything that we do in every day. And help us, Lord, to never be ashamed of Jesus, and help us to, uh, to stay focused on him with our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. I think that's it. Brother Marco. Yeah, it's, it's a little tall. Uh, well, again, thank you for coming. Thank you for visiting. Uh, I hope you're blessed. Understanding God's sovereignty, that is something very special that needs to be applied in our lives. That God is full control. That Jesus himself knows everything. He knows your heart. So I hope that you've received God's word and now you go out there and share it. I want to just remind you that we are doing GLS signups. So if, before you leave, if you haven't signed up, there is a table out there, and just ask. Ask what do we need to do, and I, trust me, it's going to be a blessing to you. Uh, with that, you are dismissed. Thank you for coming, and God bless you all.